so he had a and he had a um, a camera and a tripod and he set it up and he was taking pictures so i was very curious i went behind his camera i saw what he was doing i saw his settings so i just copied the settings on my camera and took a picture and i went to my dark room in the school and i made a print and when i saw the print and i saw his pictures they were identical the same so what i did was i i went to uh my headmaster the next day and i said to him this picture i took so can i be the school photographer <laughs> <laughs> okay so you see you have to be brave you have to be you must have you must be able to um, say what you want to it's very important so he said okay uh, as long as it doesn't uh, uh, you know interfere with your studies that's fine so he gave so i gave him the uh, uh, so i gave him the print and then i started doing all the photography for the school including all the pictures for the class photos the the uh, the pictures that we used to do for for the sports day and i begin to make a lot of money mm mm-hmm. okay from the age of 13 12 13 i was making a lot of money in school can you imagine my school had 40 students per class 10 classes per form six forms so you do the math and every year i was making at least about 20000 25000 wow <laughs> every year and that was so many years ago that's a lot of money yeah my cost my cost was just for 10 cents per picture i mm-hmm. sold it for 1 okay so that's when i first got the uh, uh i was interested in actually uh photography because it was actually quite interesting but prior to that before that my mother was the photographer in the house she is the one who took all the pictures in the house and she had a very very good eye even now she draws she paints and i think uh, the artistic side of the family comes from my mother so uh, so i think that's how it all started uh, this interest in photography this the 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 need to capture something you see something that's beautiful and you want to try and capture it and that's how it all started So after that you know you finished school you finished university I came back and I was here uh, I joined the newspaper and when I worked for this newspaper uh I found that um there's so much to learn and in a newspaper you're exposed to different types of photography uh, not just for the journalism but your know, landscapes and architecture because in a, in a in a newspaper you're you're doing everything mm-hmm. right so i used to write as well so i used to write as well as take pictures so this was something that was very very uh, uh good for me it was a very good learning place place where you learn so many things and i had excellent uh, excellent editors and other photographers used to teach me so for me this was a uh, really very very uh, it's, a, it's a good time it was a very good time for me uh, to learn yeah so like uh, you you are a former lawyer yeah so yes sorry so you know you went australia i think malaysia and australia yeah. your studies yeah yeah then lawyer la irundirkinga and newspaper la newspaper la vela senjirkinga how you balance mm-hmm. your how you manage to do that i i never practice i never practice as a lawyer lawyer and vela seve illa all right for me it was just a uh, a case of um um working straight went straight into uh, to the uh, newspapers and i started working there mm-hmm. okay sir so i never practiced so i have no experience as a practicing lawyer no, no. Oh, oh that's very surprising <laughs> okay sir no but there was no need to because for me all i wanted to do was photography so everything else was not important for me okay sir so why you want to do photography what photography mean to you i think like any kind of art form 
whether it is drawing or whether it's photography or painting. It is a way to express yourself creativity. You know, uh, it's a creative expression. And I think many people have different ways of expressing that. So for me, photography was a very powerful way of um, saying what I wanted to say. And, and that's basically how it was. So how you became a photojournalist? Photojournalist, you pretty awning, eh? And uh, I did not. I did not become a. I did not become a photojournalist. What happened was I applied for a job in a newspaper, and they took me, and that's how it all started. So I didn't. You know, you don't. You're not born a photojournalist. But I think um, I was very inspired by some of the great photojournalists around the world. I used to read a lot about people like Henry Cartier-Bresson. Uh, Robert Kappa, all these famous photographers um, in this country, uh, yeah, in, in, in the US, in, in, in France. Uh, and even here in Malaysia, we had some amazing photographers like uh, Mr. Eric Paris, uh, from, um, uh, who used to work for the New Straits Times. Uh, there are many photographers in this country too, who, were, who really inspired me. So for me, this was very, very important to try and do something. Why, why photojournalism? For me, very simple. For me, it was to do something with a purpose. Photography with a purpose. That's very, very important. No matter what you do, no matter what kind of photography you do, no matter what you do in life, you need to have a purpose. Why do you do this? If you're doing this um, to earn a living, fine. But then is there a greater purpose? Is there a bigger purpose in life? So you have to ask yourself this question. So for me, uh, I wanted to document my country, to photograph my country, to photograph the people in my country. So I spent many, many years traveling, even the weekends, on the weekends I would go. I would spend a lot of time traveling around the country and photographing people, photographing our landscapes. Mm -hmm. And you will notice that throughout the years, our landscape is changing. Our landscape is changing. Our people are changing the way, that, the way we dress. Everything is changing. So it's a very important thing to document and to record. It. So because if we don't, as photographers, if we don't make an effort to record this, we will not have a record next time. No one will have you. We will not be able to know what the country looked like before. So this is um, very, very interesting and very, very important to me. So do you want to share some pictures of sure. photojournalists? Well, you know, I was going to show you uh, some pictures of uh, landscapes. But before I do that, I wanted to show you some pictures of... Um, let me, let me uh, try and uh, show you some pictures of our Orang Asli people. Okay. Our Orang Asli people are, are all over the country. Give me a second. Kansas. Yeah, so they live uh, in, of course, they live in all the different areas uh, in, in the outskirts, in the, in the city, outside the cities. And, and, they, uh, and they struggle. They struggle to live every day. I'm going to just show you now a few pictures. I'm going to share my screen. I, I hope I'm doing this correctly. Can, sir, can. Okay, can you see that? Yes, I can see that. Okay, one, one moment. I'm just going to show you. You know, we take for granted, we take for granted uh, how the basic uh, necessities in life we, we take for granted, we, we think, you know, we turn on the tap, we get water. But the most basic things uh, um, in, in um, life are denied to the Orang Asli. I'm afraid that they don't have, you know, the first people who, to be here in this country, and they don't have even the most basic of uh, necessities. And I'm going to show you some pictures how this lady gets water every day. She has to walk two kilometers to get water, just water every day. And this is how she carries it. I'm going to show you. Um, can you see? Can you see the pictures turning? Can, sir. Can, can. I can see the picture. Right. So, right. The so you can see how, 
how difficult it is. And they have to carry this uh, water all the way up um, to their village. This is very, very difficult. It's 20 kilos of water in that basket that she's carrying, all right? Now, I, when I talk about my, my Orang Asli work that I do with my Orang Asli people, I think uh, it's very important um, to, to tell you that um, these people need a lot of help. They are this way because we have not done enough for them. In fact, the Orang Asli people, I should put it this way, the Orang Asli people will not need our help if we did not go into their jungles and pollute their rivers, if we did not go into their jungles and cut down the trees, they won't need our help. Because we have gone there, we have polluted the rivers, we have done all these things, they are now in a very difficult situation. And this is the problem. And this is the biggest problem that they, they, they suffer. This picture, you will notice, um, uh, this child has a skin problem because the water that comes from the ground, they have a well and the well has got um, chemicals. It's got all these uh, pesticides from the, uh, from the estates. Uh, it's got all kinds of um, herbicides, pesticides and fertilizers. So, and this is the same water that they have to drink, the same water that they have to bathe in. So I'm gonna show you. And this is how they, they eat together as a family. Can you see these pictures? Sorry. Yes, yes, sir. I can see. Okay. Can I make it full screen? I'm not sure whether I can do it full screen. Oh, is that better? Yes, yes. So every morning they walk to the river, which is actually not a river. It's just an old uh, uh, pond where the water is not even flowing. When it rains, the, the, the water fills up and then uh, it becomes a place where they, they, they get their drinking water from, they get everything from. Can you see this? Sorry. Yes, yes, I can see. Uh, are the pictures turning? Sorry. Oh, it is, right? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. So you can see there are lots the of... I'm sorry? Inga, which place is this? Inga in the Putting. Okay, this is in Pahang. This is in Pahang. Is this uh, Taman Nagara? This is where. Sorry? Is that Taman Nagara? No, this is near Lake Chini. And this is where a lot of development is going to happen again. And there's lots of logging that's going on in Lake Chini, which is actually a gazetted area. So a lot of things are going on, and this needs to stop. I'll just go on, I'll show you a few more pictures. And you can see they have no water, they have no electricity, but then you can see power cables. Can you see the power cables? Yes, yes, I can see the power Yeah, cables. right, see, but in spite of having water supply and electricity nearby, they're not able to get anything. And this is very sad. Yes, it is. Can you imagine you living like this every day? And this is how they get, look at that water, that water supply in the ground, that's where he gets his water from. So when was this? Again, this is in the same area. This is in, uh, when, when? Epo? Oh, this was uh, two years ago. Two years ago? Yes. So, in now, if you look at this... Yeah, rumba, rumba politar, okay? Yes, look at this picture. Who this is it? a rubbish tip. This yeah. is a rubbish tip. Okay. You know, it's a landfill where all the rubbish from around this area gets dumped onto this landfill. And this is very sad. So as a photojournalist, um, when I was taking these pictures, my aim was to show Malaysians how our Orang Asli have to live. You know, I has, as a journalist, I have been around the whole world. 
I've worked in many countries. I have, I, and I can tell you, um, um, I've seen this in Pakistan. I've seen this in Bangladesh. I've seen this in Indonesia, all right? But I've never seen this in Malaysia until two years ago. Mm -hmm. This is not, this is completely wrong. Sir, Nambu, actually, as a photographer, you are a photographer, and you are a and then you publish in newspaper. You are a photographer, and you are a you know, and the respective person, the base here, and you are But as a people, Nambu, what can you do? What we can do for them? Well, first of all, we need to understand how they live. If we don't understand how they live, then it's very difficult for us to help them. All right. So it's very important to have a clear understanding of what, how they live and what they need. All right. Because, you know, um, if you look at the pictures, I'll, I will explain to that to you a little more, but I want to show you a few more pictures. Okay. And it's really very heartbreaking because um, a child shouldn't be living like this. No child anywhere in the world. You know, we spend a lot of money. Um, we send donations all over the world for children who are suffering from different parts of the world. But we need to do more for our orang asli. This is so important. I'm very surprised to hear that this happened two years before. So, number development on the Yes. Now, this is another village where they're not so badly affected. I'll show you this, this another, another shot. So if you look, uh, this is another village. There's a bit of a delay when I when I flip the pictures. It's taking some time to show up, but it's okay. That's okay. Yeah, but still they don't have enough. So did you publish this to any newspaper? Yes, it came out in, in the Malaysian Inside, Insight and then also in the Malay Mail and okay. a few other uh, magazines, international magazines, it came out as well. Okay. Uh, but this is important. Um, I mean, look at the child, look at the face of this child. Such a beautiful, beautiful child. Um, and uh, has got not enough to eat. Oh. So you find, if you look at old pictures of the Orang Asli in this country, you'll find that they're not overweight, that they are very lean, they're very strong. But now you find obesity is a problem mm -hmm. because they take too much sugar. And the sugar is coming from cheap foods, right? And this is one of the problems that the Orang Asli are having now. They are eating foods that traditionally they never ate. You know, in the jungles, there's no sugar. Maybe you eat a banana, you get some sugar. You eat a fruit, you get some sugar. But they also work, uh, you know, they, they farm, they do their own hunter-gatherers. They go around and they do so much. And, and they are fit. But now you find obesity, you know, they're getting too fat. And that's because, not because they're lazy, it's because the diet that they have is very poor. There are some pictures again, uh, that, you know, many politicians have taken advantage of these orang asli and just, you know, they give them t-shirts like this. You know what this means. Yeah, Malu, Malu, a boss, something, boss school. Malu, upper boss Malu, upper school. You know, boss this school. Is <laughs> <laughs> and of course, 
the government then was going around giving them all these t-shirts, but not giving them food, not giving them enough to live. But they would give them t-shirts like this. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah, these I are the things. As a photographer, I take these pictures. It is to tell, it's to tell a story. There is a message that we have to, to, to pass on when we take these pictures. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to take these pictures. There's nothing wrong because you're telling the truth. Okay. So I have a question. Sure. So how to, became, how to become a photojournalist? How do you become? Yes, how to become a photo, photojournalist? Well, first of all, you have to really want to... Um, fight for the rights of people. And I think as a journalist, as a photojournalist, you want to be able to record what is happening. That must be your main, main focus. That must be your main focus. That you want to tell the story of other people. It's not always suffering. There are some good stories that you can tell as well, right? But it doesn't have to be always terrible stories. But unfortunately, in this country, in this time where we're living now, in this age, there's so many terrible things that's going on, and we need to tell these stories. And so if you have that focus, then you can become a photojournalist. It's not a, you, it's, you don't need a special, you don't need special qualifications, all right? All is you need to have a heart to go out and photograph. So, if you... Uh... Okay, I learned photography just by trial and error. Pick up a camera, try it, make a mistake. It's okay. It doesn't matter if you make mistakes. Our, you know, you can keep making mistakes again and again and again. It doesn't matter. The more mistakes you make, the better because you will learn faster. Right? So don't be afraid of making mistakes. Take pictures, try, try again, and keep trying. And there's nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. So, and that's how you slowly improve yourself. Okay, sir. I'm going to very quickly go through a few more pictures uh, with you. Yeah, sure. And then we'll move on to the landscapes, the aerial photography side of things. I just wanted to focus on two things today. One is the plight of our Orang Asli. Uh, and just like uh, many of the Indians in outside of Kuala Lumpur um, who suffer again in the estates because of poor education and, and poor resources, the Orang Asli are 10 times worse. Mm -hmm. 10 times worse. All right. So um, look at these two children. Mm -hmm. It's terrible, they have no slippers on. And look at what is hanging on their neck. She is carrying, uh, she has a pacifier. She's, they are, she's four years old. Okay. And every day, twice a day, when the rubbish truck comes to drop the rubbish in the, in the, in the um, rubbish tip, they will run in like flies. They will jump into the pit and start picking rubbish. They are given these bags. The bags are supplied to them by the recycling people. You know, the recycling people who come there and give them the bags and look at this. Okay. Okay, sir. Look at this child. Yes. In, in, inside, uh, wait, hang on. It's in the pit. Can you see that? Yes, yes. He's five years old. Yes. Would you allow your five-year-old child to go anywhere near this place? No. Yeah. So why will we allow another child from another, uh, you know, community do this? We have to stop this. Yeah. You see that mattress? And they are so resourceful. These children are so smart. They know what can be recycled and what cannot. Yeah. They have learned how to do this. You're four years old, five years old. Look at her mouth. She's still holding on 
she has a pacifier in her mouth. Yeah. Can you imagine and doing the work of an adult? Hmm. So sad to, to see. We honest. need to see this. We need to see this every day. Every day I look at these pictures because it reminds me how lucky we are. It reminds me how fortunate we are in the cities. We don't have to live like this. <laughs> but then we also have problems in the cities. Even the urban poor, there are many people who live in the outskirts in the cities who are suffering right now because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. So many children are suffering. Right? So as for a journalist, we have a duty. We have a duty of care. We need to actually go out and show people, hey, look, this is how, this is how our people are living. And they are our people. You know, not we know. We cannot look at them as for an asli, I'm Indian, I'm Chinese, I'm Malay. You can't look at that anymore that way. We are one community. We live in this one country. We can't change anything, but we can make the lives of these Orang Asli much better. So we have a message from Jennifer Ho. Sure. Yeah. Jennifer Ho heard a message on the case. Such important work yeah. and documentation of what is happening and to focus on bringing justice to the people. Yes. Yes. It's very important. Uh, Jennifer lives in Thailand. Um, and, and I find that um, and Miss Jennifer has also traveled around the world. So she has seen how communities live and for her to say this uh, I think she must really understand what these people must be going through mm -hmm. uh, look in a mattress that somebody threw it away these four children picked it up and they sold it for 10 ringgits yes sir. Yeah. water is a big problem in, in all these areas. You know, in a country where it rains every day, where there's so much water you know, in the tropics, why can't these people have clean water? Is it so, is it so much to ask? So, you know, the message on the BJ Veerasamy, yes. heartbreaking right here in our country. Yes, yes. BJ uh, is also used to be a a journalist, um, and uh, and I think uh, all these people have seen, uh, they have, they understand, they know, they have seen what's been happening in the country, and I think this is important for um, more journalists need to do something about this. They need to see, they need to understand, and they need to um, tell their own story as well. Uh, that's our strength, you know. As journalists, we have. Uh, the power to, to change things, but we need to do it in a responsible way. So I want this thing to change. So when you think this will, they will become, become a better person. Well, you know, I don't know when it will happen, but the more and more we focus on trying to improve their lives, uh, then uh, collectively, we, we need to spend time. We need to spend time. It's not going to happen overnight. Maybe in another 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. But there are many NGOs who do a lot of work to help these communities. Um, and these NGOs, some of them are international NGOs, some of them are local NGOs. But they all go around and they try to help these communities because the government is not doing enough. The government is just not doing enough. And, you know, once these pictures were published two years ago, uh, in 2020, actually it happened in 2020, all these pictures were published. And immediately all the ministers and the Tunku Makota of Pahang, everybody came to the rubbish tip to have a look. So you can see the power of photography, the power that a journalist actually has. We need to harness it so that we can help these people. So, of course, the ministers came, everybody came to have a look um, and how they could help. 
But then immediately after that, we had a change of government. Oh. So nothing happened. So nothing happened. So the whole thing went. So again, now I continue to help them. Uh, I still go back. I go back to this, these villages and I go to help them. Uh, you know, we get rice, we get food supplies, we get uh, milk powders, we get all these things and we send it to them. And I think this is very important. Yes. Yeah. That we can do little things, but the long-term solution, the long-term solution is really about improving their way of life, right? Uh, like I said earlier, if we did not interfere in their lives, they will not need us. But because we have stolen their land, we have, um, you know, we have polluted the rivers. We, and because we have, um, uh, uh, you know, we I need to... So much of yeah, we Exactly. So if we can stop that, maybe their lives will change better. Yes. You know, you know, right now in Slango, there's a, they, they're trying to de-gazette a forest reserve. And that's wrong. Mm -hmm. It is wrong. How can you do that? This was a, for, it was a gazetted piece of land specifically meant for the Orangas. And now you're, you're changing the, 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 the status of the land, the state. And, and, and that's what they're going to do. These people have nowhere else to go. They've lived there for hundreds of years. Yeah. You know? So that's wrong. So these are our government is doing this, and that's wrong. Look at what's happening in Lake Chini. I said Chini, all this development is going on. Yep. I hope somebody from uh, somebody respective uh, person will will watch this interview, this talk show, and yep. they'll they'll go through all these images. Right, right. So if one day, well, uh, previous, like two months, a few months before one day, I have done uh, research on uh, Malaysian, uh, Malaysian, but Malaysia forest, but yeah. So Malaysia is one right. of the, one of the uh, highest uh, ranking country in uh, deforestation. Yes. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. You see, um, What's very interesting to understand is every country will need to do um, deforestation, some deforestation. Every country will need to plant cash crops like oil palm and rubber. These things are important, all right? But we have to do it responsibly. You know, we, we have to be responsible about doing these things. We can't take land that the, the Orang Asli, the indigenous people have been living in for thousands of years and then and then take the land away and then not do something about it so you have you know it's not it's not only happening here it's happening even in south america it's happening in all these different countries but so we're not the first ones to 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 um uh take away steal the land from our, our the indigenous people we're not the first it's happened for many 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 years in fact the british came here and they took land from the orangasli as well you know, uh, we, we must be clear about all these things. You know? um, uh, I mean, they were not angels. They took our land, they took our, our hard woods, they took it back to England, they took our tin, all these things they did. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> so we, should, we, we should learn from this and, and we should say, look, you know, we will not do that anymore. We have to help our own people. But then, you know, greed, we're greedy. We're greedy people. We got to stop being greedy. <laughs> so, can you tell me, uh, what, what camera, what camera, what camera, what camera, what camera, what camera, what for documentary? Okay, uh, for document, well, I basically use only uh, one camera and two lenses. Or, uh, two cameras and two lenses. I use a wide angle lens which is like a 24 millimeter lens on one camera. And then I use a standard 50 mm lens on another camera. These are the two lenses that I use. I only use prime lenses. Prime lenses are important because they are, you know, they are, they are much brighter. Uh, they have a very uh, wide uh, aperture opening. And that's all I use. 
we don't need a lot of equipment uh, when we do uh, when we do this work. So in a camera, bagay. and you don't sorry, and you don't need to have you know as a documentary photographer as a as a uh, as a photojournalist, you want to be as quiet as possible. You want people to see. You just take a picture quickly, take a picture and put it away. Do it very quickly, put it away. All right. So that's important. What is your camera? In oh. the camera beginning. Okay. okay, I have, I use a, right now I'm using a Sigma FP. You see this t-shirt? <laughs> Uh, I use a Sigma. I'm working together now with Sigma uh, because we're doing an aerial photography project to photograph Southeast Asia from the air. Mm -hmm. So we're going on a helicopter together with Bell Helicopters. Uh, Bell Helicopters is based in, in the US. Uh, and so we'll be working on a project with Bell Helicopters and Sigma camera in Japan. And we're photographing all of Southeast Asia from the air. Mm -hmm. okay, so right. two years ago, uh, three years ago, I did a project photographing Malaysia from the air. And also, and, and at that time I hired, um, I hired uh, 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 Bell helicopters for the job. So I'm going to show you some pictures now of, uh, can you see that? Yes, sir. Can. Right. Okay. Uh, these are pictures of our beautiful country taken from a helicopter uh, all over the country. So I'm just going to very quickly go through with you. Okay. All right. And oh, you can stop and ask me. You can ask me anytime. You can stop. You can ask me. Yeah, sure, sure. Right. So I want to ask you in the aerial photographer one day. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, people are using drones. Drones on the yeah. uh, aerial photography. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the drone package on the what are the pros and cons of you are using drones? Okay, um, I uh, see drones have limitations because of the size of the sensors. The sensor size is very small. Unless you're using a drone and you put an actual big camera on it. Uh, the drones that have built-in cameras, the resolution, I think, is not good enough because you want to see detail. You want to be able to see detail and, and, and a small sensor will not be able to capture that detail. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Yeah. So those are the disadvantages. There are many advantages as well. You know, anywhere you can go, it is very cheap. You know, you can just send a drone up straight away and you can take pictures. Uh, but you must know where you're going to go. And you have a, the disadvantages. You can't really uh, go anywhere you want because there's certain areas your drone can only go a certain distance, half an hour flying time, and then you have to come back. All right? But yeah. with a helicopter, I can fly for two, three hours at a time. You know? And I can go much further and I can see what I'm going to photograph. There's a big difference uh, looking at your screen and taking a picture. And when you're up in the air and you're looking at down at, at, at the scene and you're taking a picture, it's a big difference. And the difference is your feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever you take a picture, you're always trying to capture not just what you see, but what you feel. Now, if you're looking at a screen, it's very difficult to feel that. You know, you're on the ground looking at a screen, it's very difficult to feel it. But if you're in the air and you can, you know, when we are in the helicopter, what we do is we normally take the door away. Okay. We take out the door. And so there's nothing uh, stopping me from jumping out. <laughs> okay. So you must not be afraid of heights. So we have a harness. I wear a harness. I'm, I'm tethered to the helicopter. And I have a headphones and I, I can talk to the pilot, tell him what to do, tell him to stop or hover or turn right, turn left. And he will do that. I'm normally sitting at the back and the pilot is in the front. Right? Sometimes I have my assistant who is next to me. All right? 
and that's how it is. So, and in, in a helicopter, we're very careful, very, very careful about uh, the equipment that we take into the helicopter. Everything has to be tied, right? Um, everything, every single piece of equipment must be tied because if it falls out of the, cam uh, of the helicopter, first of all, you lose your equipment. Secondly, if that equipment, equipment lens or camera were to hit the tail rotor, you know, the tail, there's a, there's a rotor there. Yeah. If you hit the tail rotor, you will surely die. There's no two ways about it. You will die. So you have to be very, very, very careful. Mm -hmm. So there have been many, you know, I've made many mistakes as a photographer. I've lost equipment, things have rolled. And, you know, uh, helicopters have been damaged. But again, like I said, you make many mistakes, you learn. You know, you will learn much faster. Well, this is a taken, picture taken from the front, but it's okay. Uh, actually, from the ground. Okay, okay. Sir, can you see this? Yes, yes, yeah. I'm seeing that. So what camera, are you using mm -hmm. medium? What camera you use for uh, your aerial photography? You know, I use a medium format camera. I use yeah. a Fuji uh, 50S uh, GFX. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I use, uh, uh, I use a Sigma. Uh, the, uh, the Sigma, uh, DP Quattro are fantastic cameras. They are amazing. They're fixed focal lens cameras. Uh, they're very fast. And, and um, you don't have to worry about changing lenses because it's all fixed. Right. So I use that for a lot of my aerial work. This was done with the Fuji. Uh, sorry, this was done with the uh, Sigma camera. The Sigma DP Zero. Medium large format camera? This is, uh, no, this is uh, smaller than 35 mm. But it has a foveon sensor. Now, the foveon sensor is fascinating. It is three-layered sensor. So the quality is as good as medium format. Mm -hmm. It's as good as medium format. If you can look at this picture. In fact, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about this picture. This is the picture that started my project mm -hmm. in Langkawi. To photograph the whole Grit and Grace book. This is the picture. Why is this picture so important? Uh -huh. Well, this is where, this is the birthplace. What you're looking at now is the birthplace of Southeast Asia. The okay. first landmass to rise from the sea 550 million years ago was this picture, was this area. This is Anadatai. You know where Anadatai is? This is in, in Langkawi, in, uh, near the, uh, the Datai Bay. Okay. So this is a very important piece of history. Uh, a geography for, for it. So whenever I go and I, I talk in schools, I, I talk to um, students and I tell them the story, why it's so important. Every one of these rocks is half a billion years old. So if you, in the part of the thing, uh, uh, do you publish this picture anyway, anywhere? Yes, this, uh, yeah, they are published in my book, uh, Grid and Grace. Uh, they are also published in different magazines and and uh, uh, websites as well. So I wanted to show you. This is again another uh, picture of. Uh, oh, you're looking at. Hang on, you're looking at uh, the tree. Are you looking at the tree now? Uh, mountains. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. I, there's a bit of a delay when I'm looking at my devices. There's yeah, a bit yeah. of a delay. I don't know which is, which is being shown. Yeah, yeah so this is, an, again, this is another one in Langkawi. Uh -huh. And I'm going to show you a few more. But this is the beauty of our country. And you will never see it unless you go in the air. Unless you, you know, you're flying, you'll never see it. If you're in a plane, you'll be too high. Uh, a drone, you may not be able to get wide enough. But with a helicopter, you can see so much more. So this is um, yeah. This is well. Oh, this is near Taiping. You see those hills in the back? That those are that's Taiping uh, hills in Taiping. Okay. 
so whenever we photograph um whenever we photograph uh with a helicopter we go very early in the morning or later in the evening uh -huh. right now this picture is very important this picture won me an award uh with sigma you know it was used in the sigma calendar it was the cover of the calendar they used this image and it's been published many times it's also in my book yeah uh, but this is a beautiful beautiful beach it's clean white sand it is so gorgeous and every time i look at this picture i want to go there <laughs> <laughs> so this picture in lankawi right this is again lankawi near yes. pulau tuba okay pulau tuba okay yeah now look at this picture here the next one it's like somewhere in china uh huh you can see that you know yeah uh but no it is here in malaysia in langkawi <laughs> so langkawi is a beautiful beautiful place in fact if you were going there again next time take your drone with you try and see if you can photograph some of these uh, areas as well sure sir i'll try <laughs> it's not difficult ஒரு <laughs> why maybe you can maybe you have to hike you have to camp you have to you know take a few days you can but you know when you're going in a helicopter you can just go straight away one go you can finish all of this so this pictures are taken early in the morning at about you know 8 o'clock in the morning see in this country um a, a helicopter is not allowed to fly unless it's military uh, or a rescue a helicopter is not allowed not allowed to fly uh before dawn or after dusk oh, okay it means before before sunrise and uh, and after sunrise you know allowed to fly mm -hmm. so so you you have to go very very early as early as you can okay so putting a black and okay black and white and color versus color adha ninga epdi paakuringa i'm already colored so it's okay <laughs> So I uh, don't black and white and why and you like very much why you like black and white I think black and white allows you you know when you remove color all you have left is form and texture that's enough in your brain will actually automatically tell you okay this is this your brain will tell you the sky is blue the sea is blue the trees are green your, your brain will tell you but what it's what it does when you take in black and white is you have control over all the different gradations gradations and and i feel i mean this is my personal opinion that um when you take in black and white it is um it actually uh the message goes through much clearly much faster Uh, i think you're able to tell a story much better with black and white yeah so all you have is just form and texture that's all and that's enough now if you look at this picture of what you're seeing now okay and if you saw too many colors it will be, become very distracting or if you take a picture of a scene of us of a beach and suddenly you find one red plastic bag on the beach you will see it. and in its spoils the it, for me it just spoils the whole uh mood of the whole area even this picture right. if i take in this picture um you will see the roof of this uh, the houses are all going to be red and then the you know there's going to be all kinds of different colors but no you know i wanted this picture to be just the way it is in black so in, uh this now you show me the cal picture yes and the cal picture in the helicopter helicopter da pudichinga la padatha yes yeah okay 
but you can i'm sure you can do this with a drone yes yes but my only my only uh, concern with drones is you're not going to have the resolution the 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 resolution you know your drone is uh, what 20 megapixel mm -hmm. i'm shooting a camera 100 megapixel mm, yeah. so you can see how different it's very different the quality is not going to be the same maybe if you look at it on a screen maybe you can uh, but, you know, it's not only about megapixel, it's about tonal range, so many different things involved. Um, if, but I think for most, you know, for most people, if, you're, if you have it on a screen, it's enough. You know, you, you make a small book, that's fine. Yeah. I'm just making huge prints. So when I have exhibitions, my pictures are very, very big, six feet wide. They're big pictures. So it, I need to have that resolution. So, uh, how to become a, a professional aerial photographer? <laughs> For me, it was completely by accident. One of my friends was supposed to go up and take pictures for his client. Um, he said to me, hey, I'm sick and I can't go. Can you just go? I said, I don't know how to do this. He said, never mind, never mind, just go. I'll show you how to do it. So, I went there one time. I took the pictures. My, the clients loved it so much. And then they called me again. And again, and again, that's how it started. No. So completely, by, completely by accident. <laughs> you know, same thing with my architectural photography. I used to do everything just so it just happened by chance. Right. So you must be, uh, you know, you must really, well, you must work hard and you must read. I think that's very important. Whether you're an aerial photography, a photographer, or, a, or, a, or if you're, a, or whether you're a, a, a photojournalist, Reading is very important. Reading and learning. And, and even now, um, if you want to know how this picture was taken, I can show you. Mm -hmm. All right. I can show you how I do. But if I if you were to read about it, you'll understand it better. Yes. You know, like this picture was taken. You know, how, you know where this picture is? Okay. Tell us. Huh? Where it was taken. It's just five minutes from KLCC. Okay. Is that uh, Bukit Tunku? No. Hey, no. I think... This is... Klangit. Bukit Tabo. Bukit, oh, Bukit Tabo. Tabo, yes, Bukit Tabo. It's beautiful. Yeah. So beautiful. Uh, so you know, the interior photographer, uh, the, uh, I mean, you have been interior, as an interior photographer. So the photos yes, are there. Yes, for uh, a world acclaim, I mean, uh, or a critical acclaim, uh, or yeah. Shangri-La Hotels, uh, the Four Seasons Resorts, Hotels for then our trend setting pictures in the Purchu Right. How you become an interior uh, photographer? Or how suddenly or interior photographer? Okay. Right? Wow. <laughs> like I said before, it was completely by accident. You know, a friend of mine was the general manager of the uh, of the um, Four Seasons Hotel in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, called me and said one of the photographers. This is 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Uh, he says the photographer missed his flight coming from the America, from the US, and uh, he can't make it. So can you help us to take a picture? So I went there. Uh, you know, he's a friend of mine. So I, I went to see and I didn't know how to do it. Interiors, I don't know. I'm a journalist. I don't know how to do this interior photography. So I immediately went to a bookshop. There used to be a bookshop called Page One Bookshop. Uh -huh. so I immediately went there and I started looking at all the books how to do interior photography. And then they were saying, oh, you must have this lighting, you must have this and that. And I thought, oh my God, how am I going to do this? I don't know how to do this at all. And then, uh, then I said, never mind, I'll just go back and have a look at the room. And when I went to the room, I saw in the room, beautiful sunlight coming into the room in the evening. Then I thought to myself, never mind, next day I'll come back same time, I'll bring my camera. And bring a few reflectors, you know, simple, you know, and I'll try and take a picture. And that's what I did. And again, the clients loved it so much. Mm -hmm. And I started doing one hotel and another hotel. And I was doing all their properties worldwide. <laughs> so, but you see, this again happened 35, you know, years ago. It was very different. The climate was very different then. Uh, there were very few photographers. Yeah. There were very few, very, very few. Uh, and photography was a very expensive uh, way of 
you know, you needed to buy lots of cameras and whatnot. It was very expensive. So not many people did it. Now, anybody with a, with a handphone camera is able to take some fantastic pictures. So the competition now is very, very, very high. Right. right. So it's more, it definitely more difficult for photographers now to make a living. It's much more difficult. I was just very lucky. I was born at a certain time in a certain, you know, in a certain country where, you know, in those days, all the photography for all the hotels, all the big architectural firms, they use only white people, only matsaris. Okay. So it, it was a disadvantage. But, you know, now and then you have a chance, you, you know, if you get an opportunity, uh, you can photograph. And, and then, you, you know, then you get popular and people like your work and then they start to hire you. And then they realize that you're so much cheaper than, you know, hiring somebody coming from America. They play that, pay for them a business class ticket to come all the way here. You know, when we can do it ourselves. Right, sir. Again, marketing is very important. We need to learn how to market. You must learn from the Americans. The Americans are very good at marketing. Right, right. They, they, they can sell sand to the Arabs. They can sell ice to the es Eskimos. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're very good at that, right? Yes. This right, is Cameron right. Highlands. Think it's there? Cameron Highlands. This is, uh, uh, no, this is, uh, this is Cameron Highlands. Okay. Nice one. The tea plantations. Okay. So, okay, sir, I have, uh, I don't know, I don't do you have a yeah. drone? I think you don't have. I know I have. I have a drone. Oh, okay. I have a Phantom. I have a Phantom Four Pro Plus. Uh huh. Uh huh. It's okay. a twenty megapixel. The the first generation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a very good drone. Uh, but I just play with it now. When I go for a holiday somewhere, I just take it with me, take a few pictures. It's good fun. Okay. Uh, but it's not the same. Completely different from taking pictures. Uh, with a uh, on a helicopter. So medium large format camera on the kind expensive are How much it will cost? Yeah, sure. Okay, a medium format camera now it's becoming very cheap. Uh, if you look at a Fuji or you look at a Hasselblad, uh, you can get all these cameras. You know, hundred megapixel camera, you can get it for twenty thousand minutes. It's very very cheap. Very very cheap. Mm -hmm. So. Um, um, yeah, that's how it is. So it is not as expensive. It used to be very expensive. In those days, I used to use a camera back called a Face One, a Face One camera back. Wow. A camera back alone cost me, alone cost me 150,000 ringgit. You know, those days you can buy a house for 150,000 ringgit. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. So, but now it's become, now it's become so much cheaper, so much cheaper. So I want to share something here. Sure. Okay. Ninga ungala sharing stop on sir. Okay, I will stop my sharing. Oh, this is the our uh, main range. Wow. This very, picture. Very nice picture. This is the main range in Pahang. Um, very close to Gunung Tahan. So, ninga irukumbo enna time irukum sir? Inda plan edukumbodhu. Oh, this is early in the morning at about maybe 8.30. Uh-huh, yeah. And it was just, it was going to rain. So just before the rain, you know, these clouds were there. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, I'll stop yeah. the sharing. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. because I want to ask a question. Uh, that's why I want to share some pictures here. Sure. Hold on. So can you... Can you see? Can you see that? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, Kuala Lumpur International Photo Awards 2020. You were one of the jury. I was one of the judges, yes. Yes. So, I don't want to ask how you become a jury around the Kekla. Because, if you are in the talk show, you are going to be a qualified person. But, what do you think about it? How a jury, how do you accumulate points? 
Okay, the jury normally, when you say the word jury, that means a few people, right? So what we do is, uh, when we receive, when we receive uh, the pictures, you now we will all receive the same pictures. Each judge will be given a hundred images, let's say. And then we will then pick uh, the 10 best or the 20, 20 best pictures. From the hundred, we'll pick 20. And then we will, so all of us will have, and we will sit down together and say, all right, I like this, I like this, I like this. And each one, each judge, normally we have about five judges. Uh, they will pick their 20 best. And then from there, we will filter, you know, make it a, make it a tighter and tighter uh, selection. And that's how we do it. It's all done in a group. Okay. So you must be able to explain. You must be able to always say why you like the picture or why you don't. Now, when I teach uh, photography, I do the same thing. Whenever I have a class, I always ask my students, so why do you like this picture or why don't you like this picture? You have to explain it. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, I like it because I like it. You can't. You must explain why. So learning how to articulate is very important. Very, very important. You must be able to explain very clearly why you like something or why you don't. It's a very good training for us. Right, sir. So, so like uh, 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 category like uh, creative, creativeness, lighting, focus, and some point. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, basically, um, depending on what level of photography, like for instance, the Kuala Lumpur International uh, Photo um, Awards. Uh, Awards, if you look at that, uh, many of the uh, pictures were shared a few times before in the previous years. So I've seen some of these pictures before. Now, there's no time limit. You can always submit once, you can submit again. There are many photographers who will take some one set of pictures, they will do a picture story, and they will send it to all the different awards around the world. There are professional photographers who do this. So they will take part in all the competitions just to win. Like, for instance, you have marathons, you have all the Nigerians, they come and take part in all the marathons around the world and they will win because they are, they're built that way. You know, they are tall and they are very fast, they're very strong. So that's what happens again. Um, the Kenyans, the, you know, the uh, Nigerians, they are very good. They, they got the build for running. So you have photographers too, who specialize in this kind of thing, just to win competitions. Uh, and they do this. So what we do is when we look at the work first, we look at the work and what is the work trying to say? Is there a message? And that's, for me, that's very important. Other judges may think differently. So for me, the main important thing, the first thing I ask myself is why is this photographer taking this picture? What is his purpose? Why is he doing this? Is he trying to tell a story? Okay. Secondly, of course, you look at lighting, you look at composition, all these things are important. Uh, but again, composition is very subjective. I may like it, you may not like it. Right. 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 So I'm always looking for something different. So I always wait for photographers to surprise me with something different, a creative composition, something I've not seen before, uh, maybe a different uh, way of, of expressing himself. Mm -hmm. These are important. Right, right. Okay, sir. Very inspiring. Sir, but, uh, one hour, we, we have been talking for one hour. One hour, my God. One hour, yes. Room vision share by the uh, photo journalism, aerial photography. So, mm -hmm. interior, uh, interior uh, photographs. So, I can show you some interior pictures later. Okay, yes, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, sure. carry on. You, can, you, can, you, have a, you have a few questions? Okay. So, Ada. Uh, uh, so, uh, the best, no? like, okay. so you can okay. share your pictures now, interior pictures on that. Okay, I just, let's, let, uh, while I get that, let me just, let me just uh, quickly look at uh, some other pictures that we're looking at. Okay, sir. Uh, just a few days ago, I posted some pictures uh, of, um, of the uh, Topkapi Palace in Istanbul. Yes. 
Yes, yes. Do you remember? Do you, do you do you remember seeing that? Yes, I remember. Okay, I'll just very quickly show you some pictures of that because these are here now. So I have a question regarding that. Sure. How you get a chance to to shoot that? Every chance on that. Okay. Well, you know because one of the well, I was hired by uh, the one of the owners of a large hotel in Istanbul. And uh, he asked me whether I could uh, photograph that because he was part of the royal family, the old royal family. So he asked me whether I could help him with that. So I'm going to just show you very quickly okay. uh, uh, what this is. Give me a second. It's just loading. Right, right. Yeah, so that's how it happened. So again, it's connections. Now, as you work around the world, as you work at, you know, different people, you meet people, you talk to people, and then they become friends. And then when they become friends, you, you start to uh, become, um, you know, then they, whenever they need some help, they will ask you, they will talk to you. And that's how you get jobs. I mean, so connections are very important. So while you're sharing, to... while you're sharing, Yes. I have a window to kill you, know. Sure. It's a little out of topic, but I'm going to talk to you. You're a veteran photographer. Uh, you have to make a history. You have to make a history in the history of photography. Uh, being a photojournalist mm -hmm. and documentary, interior. You have to make a clean photo. You have to make a real photo. But you have to make a famous photo in social media. La, famous illa. You are not famous in social media. Rombo appear when the Ipo current situation on the Ipo social media, one of the uh, Nasorde, Makal to Derek up a serum, social media. So Ning on the social media, Ipo the Wonder King and Anagram. So other thing a famous Illa. But you're pretty famous, I heard the Solinga. So okay, other the elegant the lesser. Elegant, they are pretty famous out of the name. But in a Kakarna, Ninga, the famous island sold day, No, I don't. I don't feel it because for me, social media is just social media. So for me, it is, it, you know, I, I post these pictures at, at, at this point of my life, all right? I don't need the money. You know, I don't need the fame. I don't need that. You know, I don't need all this. For me, what's important is uh, why I posted these pictures. Let me tell you why I posted these pictures of okay. Topkapi Palace. Right. I was with a friend of mine and she's saying, you know, I'm getting old. I want to go and see a few places. Topkapi Palace, something I want to go and have a look. And she said, I hope, uh, you know, I, I, I can live a few more years so that I can go and see this place. So I said, okay, I will show you pictures of Topkapi Palace. I'll post it. Uh, on the internet, then you can have a look at it. And that's why I posted these pictures. So I'm just going to turn it on now. Hold on one second. All right, all right. One moment. It's okay, sir. Take your time. It was so interesting to talk to you. And uh, it's my pleasure, I mean, very pleasure. I'm very happy to talk to you. Rombo is friendly, Rombo is genuine. And I don't know if you are a photographer, you are a person. You are a person. You are a good person. No, it's not. You know, it's not at all. I mean, for me, as long as anyone has interest, anyone has interest, um, I would be so happy to share, so happy to, to, uh, to help them. For me, that's always been my, my uh, way of trying to uh, help. Okay, I'm going right. to share the screen. Right, sir, right. Okay, there yes, is I that. Can. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, let me just... So these are pictures of Topkapi. Uh, just a few pictures, not too many. Okay. Uh, okay, can you see that? 
Yes, yes. Right. So, so again, uh, when you do interior photography, especially in a, in a historical place like this, there are many challenges. One of the challenges is they normally don't allow you to bring too many uh, pieces of equipment inside. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to be very mindful of what you need to bring in. So normally I only have one good strong tripod. And in this case, I just use you know, styrofoam, uh -huh. styrofoam boards, eight by four. I have about 10 of those. Okay. And we brought it in and we just reflect light. That's all we do, just reflect light. Reflect light from the windows. And you're using a slow shutter speed. Yeah. So you can take your time. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. Very, very nice. Picture. I think it's, uh, simple. It, it's a simple pictures. They're not, it's not, anybody can do this. Anybody can do it. Yeah. It's not difficult. You just need to understand light and understand how it is you want to show. Yeah. Like this is a beautiful ceiling. Yeah. Right. Most people, when they walk into a room, they just look around, they don't look up. So for me, I found these ceilings to be so beautiful. So now, in the interior shot, but you can see one of So usually in my interior shot, uh, photography, say more there, focusing is so important. Focus on the room is important. Mm -hmm. If you want to see this part, you can focus on the room. How you may, where you... Okay, this, okay. In, in the part there, I was using a 14 to 24 as a zoom lens. As a Nikon, I was using a Nikon equipment. Um, uh, and the 14 to 24 uh -huh. zoom lens. And wide apple. Uh, so I was using an uh, aperture of about f8. Uh -huh. Shutter speed, whatever whatever comes. You know? okay, okay. So depending on, you know, and normally it's a very low shutter speed. Normally one second, two second exposure sometimes. Yeah. Because it's very dark, these places. Uh -huh. So and that's it. It's not it's not difficult to do. So it's just your angle. You got to make sure you get your angles right. But how about the focus? Where you focus? So the focus, yeah, the focus at f eight wide angle lens. You don't have to focus much at all. Yeah, yeah. Anywhere it'll be it'll surely be sharp. You know? Yes, yes. Yeah. So there's something called hyperfocal distance. Are you are you familiar with that? Yeah. Hyperfocal distance, no? Yes. Uh, so if you read about hyperfocal distance, you'll find. It's very easy way of, of, of getting everything in focus. Nowadays, they also use uh, stack focusing. Yeah. Stack focusing, you, so you, you understand that as well. So it's yeah. easy. So these are simple shots, very, very simple shots. They're not difficult to do. Just position yourself. I'm lying down on the, on the floor, you know, I and mean, the camera is on a tripod. Very nice. It's a great honor you get a chance to shoot this. Yeah, well, you know, it's meant to be sometimes. Something, sometimes these things happen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can try very hard to, to do this kind of work. You never get it. Sometimes you least expect it. It'll happen. Yeah. Vidhi. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, I have some... all these things. All these things, you know, you can plan. If it happens, it happens, but don't be disappointed. Try it, try your best. You must always try your best to do and go and do. I'll give an example, all right? If you really, when I first started off doing some, some uh, commercial photography, uh, you know, I was trying to earn extra money. I would go and say to a hotel, I said, look, I will take these pictures for you, all free. You like it, you pay. Mm -hmm. If you don't like it, I'll take my pictures back. Then they say, okay. And that's how it starts. So go out. You know, sometimes you have to put your own uh, money up front first. If not, people won't, you know, they don't know you. So why should they hire you? Yeah. Sometimes you have to, um, you have to make an effort. And these days, you know, you go with a digital camera, you're not going to, spend a lot of money you know those days film and all that's very expensive 
now with digital camera you can make take a picture you can take 10 different pictures different exposure everything you can do you can come back and work on it on a computer and guarantee your pictures will be good <laughs> those days those days those days you can't yeah if you make one mistake you process the film wrongly you do something wrong it's all gone yes right so you have you know those days we had many advantages but nowadays i think you have uh, you have a better chance of of um, of of getting it right better chance but you must understand light the light's very important right sir so i want to ask something here sure so sh- screen sharing a uh, no oh, i'll turn it off yeah okay okay i want to share uh can you see the picture Oh yes. <laughs> okay. So we did we did in the you have uh, discussed when it came Prince Charles could when he was in Penang 2018 I think. Yeah. yeah. So okay, okay. what happened happen was yeah I was in, I was invited by the British High Commissioner to present my book to uh, Prince Charles. So my book there's a big huge book of uh, grit and grace a 6 kilos. So uh so they invited me to penang and asked me to um they asked me to present the book to him mm-hmm. so that's what i did so when i presented to him i, I was explaining to him uh um, because he's also a conservationist he does a lot of work trying to save the rainforests all over the world yeah so i was talking to him about this and he was asking me many questions about how i did the photography you know what kind of helicopters i was using Uh, you know how i you know she was very interested in what i was doing and of course i also met his wife um and we all uh, had a long discussion about 15 20 minutes we sat down and we spoke yeah okay so so it's, it's a good privilege to then of course when he went back to to england he sent me a letter saying thank you very much for the book so all these things are you know it's part of the whole um so can you imagine if i did not do the book I would not have met this man I would not have met so many people Yeah so we just lucky sometimes we just lucky Sure sir So for for one and a half hours we've been talking and your your life vende engitta ingoda nareye share paninga So I think I have few more ungitta sir kelvi kekano what is your future plans what are your plans iruka Right right now as I said just now I'm working with Sigma cameras and uh, also uh, Bell helicopters and we are going to be photographing Southeast Asia from the air so I'm using a Sigma FP camera and we're going all over the uh, all over Southeast Asia so we'll be working because a helicopter can only fly at about 2 hours time every time uh, we have to stop so we have to go from let's say we're going to do from here we will photograph we start from kuala lumpur we will go to penang and then from penang we'll stop in bangkok bangkok to you know we'll go to different part of the country and then we'll we'll photograph that way and of course this is a this is a for this is a two year project because oh, we'll yeah. be also be going to two 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 to three years at least we'll be going to the philippines we're going to myanmar to all these different so we were actually supposed to start start in january of 2020 but you know because of the pandemic yeah uh nothing happened okay okay <laughs> right sir hopefully everything will be all right and you will be yeah. in your plan soon right and you know what if it's meant to be it's meant to be if it happens it's supposed to happen it will happen but we have to keep working we have to keep trying to make sure that you know uh, get everything done you know you must try very hard you know they always tell you this right you know people always hope oh, i want to i want to win the lottery i want to win the lottery i want to win the lottery people always hope right and then they will go to the shop and they will buy the lottery tickets but there are many people who hope but then they don't even go and buy the tickets <laughs> so how do you win 
Okay, sir. Right. So right. go buy your ticket. Buy your ticket. Work very hard, and then maybe it'll happen. You know. Right, sir. Right. And so, we're going to cut some more cake. Sure. Uh, what is your piece of advice for young generation? All the photographer okay. enthusiast. அவங்களுக்கு வந்து என்ன ஒரு அட்வைஸா கொடுக்குறீங்க ஐதர் ஃபுல் டைமரா இல்ல பார்ட் டைமரா ஓகே ஆம் யூ மஸ்ட் பீ கன்வின்ஸ்ட் யூ மஸ்ட் ஆல்வேஸ் பீ வெரி வெரி கன்வின்ஸ்ட் ஆஃப் வாட் யூ வாண்ட் டு டு ஆ இஸ் இட் ஃபோட்டோகிராஃபி ஆர் யூ ரியலி இன்டு ஃபோட்டோகிராஃபி இஸ் தட் வாட் யூ ரியலி வாண்ட் டு டு ஆ ஆர் யூ டுயிங் இட் ஜஸ்ட் டு earn money so these are the things that we have to ask ourselves very very important mm-hmm. um do it because you love it you must do photography because you enjoy it it, it must become like breathing it must become like part of you your camera is part of your eye everything is just part of you and that's very important right sir. and i think that is my advice and read read about sociology read about anthropology all these are very very important things for you to do right very very important yeah right it's sir. not difficult you know but really it is not difficult right. uh if you are focused you will do well you just must be focused right sir right So uh, actually okay ஒரு முடிவுக்கு வந்துட்டோம் நம்ம ஷோக்கு பட் எனிவே நீங்க போயிராதீங்க just hold okay. on hold பண்ணிருங்க okay we are going to share your web website our website so we are sharing your oh, website okay. now so avaru patti vende avaru patti innum nariye therinjikonona avaru website irukku scsegar.com poringa theriyum in the in the in the website romba very old is not been updated but you know look at my facebook facebook la paatha nare pudusa they'll see all my new works <laughs> i have to i have to actually i have to actually uh, do more on on my my website which i'm going to do now that we have a lot of free time i'm going to redo my website and put in all the new pictures so until then you can still have a look at the old one it's okay sure adhe mari avaru instagram page iruke so instagram page unde avanga poi paakalam okay and then எஸ்சி சேகர் சொல்லிட்டு நீங்க ஜஸ்ட் இன்ஸ்டாகிராம் இன்ஸ்டாகிராம் போயிட்டு எஸ்சி சேகர் கிளிக் பண்ணாலே போதும் அவரோட பேச வரும் அண்ட் ஹேவ் சம்திங் டு ஷேர் அபவுட் ஹீஸ் என்ன சொல்றது ஒரு ஒரு கிரீட் அண்ட் கிரேஸ் சொல்லிட்டு ஒரு புக்கு பத்தி சொல்லிக்கிட்டு இருந்தாரு ஸோ அந்த புக்கு பத்தி நான் வந்து ஷேர் பண்ண போறேன் உங்களுக்கு வாட் ஐம் டு ஷேர் ஹியர் அந்த புக்கு வந்து யாராவதுக்கும் இஃப் யூ வாண்ட் பாய் நீங்க வந்து இஃப் வாண்ட் பாய் த புக் யூ கேன் பாய் ஃப்ரம் ஹீம் 1500 ringgit uh, idu or 6 kilo books avaru sonna mari or 6 kilo book okay idu enna nu pathina greet and grace patti saba art gallery la vande or exhibition nadathirukkaru not only saba everywhere all over, all over in penang in kl in sarawak saba it went all over the country okay sir so indha book vande neenga vaangu vaangringa avarku neenga direct ah contact pannalam 1500 ringgit so விருப்பம்ிங்கிருப்பிச்சு <laughs> Thank you, sir. So, this is our Instagram page. You can see it. Okay. So, to all my viewers, to all the guests, and thank you. Thank you for watching uh, our show today. Thank you very much. With uh, Mr. S.E. Sager.